Hebrews, a little book of, well, it's not such a little book, but Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. You know, we going through this pandemic thing, and some people think that's really terrible. But you know, there's a big shakeup coming. And it's uh, going to be a lot more of a shakeup than this pandemic's been. And, uh, Really, we need to pray for our country. Um, you know, President Trump, when he was president, he's not now. Our president now is Joe Biden. He got elected. And uh, he said he's going to go to Washington and drain the swamp. But, you know, there's a lot of people up there that probably ought to be in prison. Yeah. But because they're high up and have a position, they can get away with things. And that's the truth. They say, well, everybody's, you know, got to go by the law. Or some rich people, some famous people, they get away with not going by it. And uh, that's my, not my main topic this morning. But, you know, the tribulation is going to be a terrible time. You think this the, this pandemic's kindergarten stuff compared to how bad it will get? It says it's going to be worse than it ever has been or ever will be. I think in Matthew it says that, and there's another place, some other places. That's right. But what I want to talk about this morning doesn't matter about all that. There's some things that aren't shakable. There's some things that are sure and set. And so those are the things I want to talk about this morning. I like to have my feet on, I, I, you know, I don't want to be firmly planted in midair. That's what the relative people are. They don't even know if they're here. Well, that's the way they talk. There's no absolutes, no absolute truths. There's no absolute right or wrong. It's just whatever I feel like. Well, that sounds like Israel back in the book of Judges. And it says, they got without a king. Well, first of all, they wanted a king. God didn't want them to get one. They went ahead and did it anyway. God said, okay. The first king didn't turn out too good. And uh, Saul, wasn't that his name? Then David came and Solomon. But the real king, they need Jesus. He's the king of the Jews. He'll be king of the universe one of these days. But some sure don't see it that way. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12 and uh, start in verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside our weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know, you're running in a race, the race of life. That's set before you. Now, we don't know how long it'll last. Hey, it's lasted, what, 83 years so far? 85. Brother Map's about 80. Your dad's 80. Was it 83? Uh -huh. Maybe that's why I got the 83. But anyway, I've only made it so far for, what, 74. Manny's down there real low. He's only, what, 30 what? Working on it. 30 what? How old? Oh, 34. 34. Man, I'd like to be 34 again. I'll be 10 more. But anyway, we don't know. But we're running a race, the race of life. Sometimes you're running uphill, sometimes you're running downhill. Sometimes you have a wind at your back, and sometimes the wind's pushing on the front end, right? Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's harder. But it's always going to be easier if you got Jesus with you. The Holy Spirit living in you, and the Word of God as your map and and uh, road directions here. But here, and some people take this verse and they think people are up in heaven looking over the banister, watching what we're doing down here, and they use these verses here to say that. Well, even if they are, they don't see all the bad stuff. But I really think it says wherefore seeing also encompassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. 
Are they up in heaven looking over the banister at us? Now I do know it says whenever somebody gets saved down here, there's rejoicing in heaven. They know about that. But I don't know if they know how many got shot in Indianapolis last night. Or that we set a record last year for the most 140 some was it? 240 some. When I was growing up, they had one or two murders in Indianapolis a year. That's about it. But he says, we got these witnesses here. Uh, you know, really, there are people watching you. They're witnesses. And then if we pass off the scene, there'll be others come fill in for us. We came and filled in for some before us. I think right. that's the idea here, boy. That yes, it, it, there always be Christians coming and filling in. They've got a race in front of them to run, the race of life. And wherefore, seeing also we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, uh, let us lay aside every weight. Do you have anything weighing you down, causing you problems? Well, I think as we get older sometimes, that kind of weighs us down a little bit. Or we have health issues. Or maybe we have emotional issues. There's all kinds of things that we go through in life. Maybe financial. They keep wanting to do this stimulus thumb stuff, you know. But there's people watching all this, seeing all this. I even think the angels are watching us. You know angels are watching you? See, they can't get saved. They don't understand salvation. And then they see you and you, they think, man, how's all that work? But then they help protect us and watch over us too in the process. The good angels. Then there's bad angels. See, there's this race and we're fighting in it. And the, the sin which does so easily beset us, let us r uh, run with patience the race that is set before us. You know, it's not, we got to have some patience. Sometimes it gets rough and it takes a while to work through it. Ask Carol. <laughs> Everybody sees her eye. Uh, verse uh, 2 looking unto Jesus the author and the finish of our faith not only did he start it and save us he's going to finish it Amen. not only will he start it and finish it he's with us as we go through the race isn't that right you ever talk to God well I'd go to work at Coke sometimes I'd talk to God so I said oh no you got to get off in the corner somewhere and bow your head and get down on your knees and well, I don't know when Peter was trying to walk on the water and he started singing, he just said, Lord, save me. Did Jesus reach out? Has Jesus ever reached out to you when you were going to, felt like you were going under? Huh? He got you through it. He has Carol, I, hasn't he gotten us through some things? Even this last year. But looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You think it was a joy for him to endure the cross? What kind of joy could you get out of somebody beating, with, beating you with a cat of nine tails, uh, pulling your beard out by the roots, putting a crown of thorns on your head? What kind of joy could you get out of that? His joy was that he saw that was the only way that he could save us. And, that, and he was willing to do it for us. And in order for him to save us, he had to suffer. In order for him to save us, he suffered our hell and took our place. That's what the Bible teaches. And uh, so he, he's the author and the finishers and he endured the cross despising the shame. He didn't like the shame, but remember he prayed, Lord, let this cup pass for me, but then nevertheless, thy will, Lord, Sometimes you might have to go through some stuff and say, Lord, uh, I don't like going through it, but if that's what has to be, whatever your will is. And it's set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Is Jesus sitting up in heaven right now at the right hand of the throne of God? Yes, sir. And when the devil comes in and accuses you, Jesus stands up and defends you. Amen. If you're saved, he's your defender. He's your mediator. Devil's always talking bad about us. Boy, did he talk bad about Job? You ever read the book of Job? Did he try, 
try to get Job in trouble. And then God said, okay, I'll let you try him, but I'm going to limit you. Well, I'm glad God limits the devil because no telling what he'd do to any of us if he could. He'd probably just kill us all. If he thought that would get what he wanted. But anyway, and sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. God's throne will never be shaken. God's in control. Some people think when this election took place and uh, we changed presidents that we're out of control now. No, God's still in control. Isn't he? So we're not going to be stressed about it. Now go down all the way down to verse 25. Seeing that ye refuse not him that speaketh. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm right. Seeing that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not uh, who refused him. I don't know if I'm in the right place here. Verse 12, 25 to 29. Yes, that's where I want to go. Seeing that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we escape if they turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Is God speaking to us from heaven when you read your Bible? Then go on next verse whose voice then shook the earth. Well, he could speak the earth in. He could speak things into existence. Uh, when he comes back, is there a sword going to come out of his mouth and be his word? Mm -hmm. And fight with the armies that are gathered around trying to destroy uh, the Jews in Israel. But now uh, he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shall not, I shall not be... I sh I shake the earth only, but also heaven and the, the world, uh, word, yet once more signifying the removal of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So God's throne's not going to be shaken. There's a lot of things going to get shaken up here on this earth. Then look at verse uh, 28 and 29. Wherefore we, receiving, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Does God have a kingdom that won't, can't be moved, won't be moved? Yes, sir. Well, remember they made fun of him. They put up over his cross, King of the Jews. He's not only King of the Jews, he's going to be King of the whole creation and everything. Isn't he? Isn't he going to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords one day? But it's going to, is he going to have to change a few things in order to do that? Remember, he came the first time as a little lamb and they slayed him. Next time he'll come as a lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, he also, it talks about him coming riding on a white horse and the armies of heaven following him. So I said, where do you read all that? In the book of Revelation. Wherefore, we're, we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Does it matter really what happens? You just keep serving God. With reverence and godly fear. Now Manny did a lesson, some lessons on fear a while back. And there's really kind of two sides to the fear. That's right. You know, people ought to be afraid of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, he could cut your heart off anytime he wants. He'd cut your hair off. That's right. So you got a reverence in that sense. God's all powerful, but He also couldn't. Didn't He give you life in the first place? That's right. So I got it from my mom and dad. And I think God started all that. Amen. Then our, our bulletin it talks about abortion, basically. It's a little baby there. You know, God knew you when you were still in the womb. So said, well, life doesn't start until you're actually born. No, it starts when you're conceived. Right. Our president that we have now needs to learn that. Amen. Clearly. He believes in aborting babies. 
even though he's Catholic. Well, he's, they've got laws saying they can do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway, it says, Wherefore we received a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Amen. Well, we need to be afraid of God because God someday will judge all of us. That's true. If we're saved, we'll go to heaven. If we reject Christ, we're going to die and go to hell. But yet, on the other hand, I, I, I'm afraid that I'll let God down. Yeah. Me too. By not living the Christian life that I ought to live. Yeah. And I might hinder somebody else from getting saved, although that's dangerous stuff. There's a sin unto death. That's true. Yeah, and there's an unpardonable sin, which is rejecting Christ. <laughs> then there's a sin unto death. And if you go over to the little epistles of John, it talks about that. To me... Uh, that sin unto death is when we get to the point where our Christian testimony might be so bad. And that's a sin I think Christians commit. Mm -hmm. Unpardonable lost people. The sin unto death has more to do with Christians that don't live for God like they ought to. And they might hinder other people from getting saved. And God just take you out of this life early. Mm -hmm. it's not even at your own. You'll go to heaven. I believe. Amen. But He'll just have you go to heaven a little sooner than you would have because you might be living in a way other people are watching you and they don't want to get saved over it. They kind of use you as their excuse. Although I was thinking about preaching a sermon about that. Don't blame God. Amen. Everybody Amen. wants to blame God. I'm working on that one. I don't have it done yet. I've decided I'm going to go. But of course... I got notes here, and I was going to stick to my notes this morning, and I'm way off of them. Amen. Isn't it awful? I don't know. I, would, I hope it's not the devil. <laughs> At least I'm reading verses out of the Bible. Amen. But you can twist verses in the Bible, too. If you pull them out of context, you can make them say about anything you want. You got to be careful. Uh, verse 29, for our God is consuming fire. Well, He can judge us, but yet on the other hand, if it weren't for Him, none of us would go to heaven. That's then right. He send His only begotten Son down here. And, and God's throne will not... Uh, in uh, Hebrews 1.8 it says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8 says, Thy throne, O God is forever and ever. And you know, we can go back if you want to study it. And I'm not, I, I'll do you like Manny. That's for another time. <laughs> it's another study. But if you go to the book of Daniel and study the second chapter and the seventh chapter, you'll find out there's been four kingdoms that have ruled the world. Babylon, mm -hmm. Medes and Persians, Medo-Persians, the Greeks and the Romans. Mm -hmm. Now, We've already come through the first time the Romans ruled the world. But it's going to be, they're going to be revived. Daniel sees this big image in chapter 2. He interprets what, what that image is. Also, there's another place in the book of Daniel where he's got a bunch of animals and they stand for different nations. Just like uh, if I say an eagle, what nation do you think of? USA. If I say a bear? Russia. Russia. So it's kind of a, like a thing like that. So you got animals and things that are for uh, the Medes and the Persians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, Rome. Yep. And if you can understand it and study it out, there have been four powers through the world, the world so far. Not Russia, not China, not America. Well, right now, the competition, I think, is between China and America. That's right. So, oh, I think it's Russia. I, I think China's higher up than Russia anymore. But we're, I guess, past the first Cold War. I don't know if we're going to have another one or not. But God knows all that. So, 
But you know, really, like I say, God's sitting on His throne. God's in control. I don't care what the politicians down here do or don't do. Amen. As far as that sense, God's going to... God could stop any one of them He wants any time He wants, or He can set them up any time He wants to set them up. That's right. Now, they might not think so, but my Bible tells me that's so. Amen. God's all-powerful. But you know, really... Yeah, years ago there was a man who was driving in along in his uh, car. It happened to be a Ford. It used to be they had a lot of Fords. And um, they started running them on assembly lines, making Fords. Uh, a guy named Henry Ford, right? But anyway, this car broke down. It was a Ford, and he was sitting down there beside the road. He couldn't get it to start. He looked under the hood. He couldn't figure it out. Finally, there's another Ford coming down the road. And the guy's pulled over and stopped, and he says, what's the problem? He says, uh, my car just quit. I can't get it going. And that guy was driving a Ford, too. And so he looked under the hood, messed around with it a little while, took his coat and hat off, and got under there. You don't want to get grease, grease on your clothes, you know. And uh, get it. a few minutes, he says, try it. Start right up. And the guy uh, went to get back in his car, and he asked him, he says, well, uh, what's your name? And he says, well, my name's uh, Henry Ford. <laughs> He's got invented that car, mm -hmm. wasn't he? Well, you know, God's the one that created and invented everything. Amen. He didn't just invent it, he created it. See, there's a difference in inventing and creating. There's a difference in making and creating. God's the creator, not just the maker. Now, we can make things, but we have to have something to make it out of. God didn't have to have anything to make it out of. He just spoke the world into cre the creation into existence. Amen. But God can do that. Yeah. And then we got to be more careful, though. We, we don't have that kind of power. These politicians don't have that kind of power. But, we, you know, here in America, I think we need to turn back to the designer and the creator. And he's the only one that can straighten our messes out. Amen. And I could go back and talk about the first Adam and the second Adam. The first Adam, did he sin? And then because of that, we're all under a curse of sin. But I'm looking for the second Adam. And he's going to come one of these days and he can straighten that sin and mess out, can he? Now, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 22 and then verse 45 says, For as in Adam all die, even so as Christ shall all be made alive. Amen. You got a choice. You're going to follow Adam, the flesh, or are you going to follow Christ, the second Adam? Well, if you want to live eternally, I think you better follow Jesus, That's right. the second Adam. Verse 45, it says, As so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. How did Adam become a soul? Well, God breathed life into him. How did you become a soul? living soul. God gave you life when you were born. He used your mom and dad. But with Adam, he didn't even do that, have to do that. He just breathed life into him. He made him out of the earth. Now, man, he's a scientist. We do have the elements of the earth in our bodies. We got some carbon, I guess. But he was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam, or the second Adam, made a living spirit. That's verse 45. I think 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, and then verse 45 is what I read to you. Did I hit them right? Yes, sir. Okay. I've got it written out here on a little piece of paper. I don't have those memorized. But anyway, I think I've established the first thing that's unshakable. You're not going to shake the throne of God. He's in control. And uh, then the second thing I want to talk about is the Word of God. And somebody says, the Word of God? Yep, right here it is. I read my Bible. I'm reading God's Word. I try to read it. I didn't do as well this last year. We, we had a few setbacks, heart attacks, and viruses. <laughs> and... But I'm still working. I'm getting. I'm close to getting through it this year, this 
well as for last year. I'm finishing up for last year. But I only like a few more books, and there's, most of them are short. But the, the, the thing, the Word of God, Psalms 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Do you think they got a perfect, I think they got the original in heaven. That's right. Exactly huh? right. The original's in heaven. And that's our real standard. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8, it says, The grass withers, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So, do you think we've got God's word today? Yes, sir. I do. When I pick my Bible up and read it, I believe I'm reading God's word. God's telling me some things. How much do you read it? But it doesn't matter whether you read it or believe it or not. It's true. Well, we say the gospel truth. Well, a lot of people get up and talk about, uh, I'm telling you the gospel truth, and they're lying to you. <laughs> Man, it's getting really, with these politicians, it's just commonplace. You don't really even know where they stand on things. And then they flip back and forth. I'm glad when God says it, that's it. Amen. If God told me that He was going to send His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, down here, and He was going to die on the cross and pay for my sins and be buried and resurrect from the dead, and if I put my trust in Him and repent of my sins and be sorry for my sins and try to turn my life around with God's help and through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, uh, that He would save me and I'm going to live in heaven with Him forever, then I believe that. And that's what I believe the Bible teaches. Anybody here believe the Bible teaches that? Yeah. Then I think it's settled, don't you? That's it. But really, I don't think there's ever been a time to... The Word of God's attacked all the time. They say there's no absolute truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus, God tells us that the Bible is the truth. But the devil, he's got a lot of people believing lies. Some don't even believe Jesus was God. They don't believe Jesus' blood can wash away your sins. I don't believe Jesus was a virgin born. This one ought to scare them. They don't believe He's coming again. Well, if He's not, then how's a man doing on straightening the mess up? Well, maybe if we get better educated. Well, they tell me, you know, I picked this Bible that I've, I've been reading since I got saved. Same Bible. I'm changed. I know there's 40, 11 different versions now. But this is the one they were preaching out of when I got saved. Amen. I was 11 years old. I've been saved ever since. Somebody says, how do you know? Well, I've got a written contract from God. That's right. It's in the Bible. Right. If I went by feelings, there might be some days I might not feel much like I'm saved. And I've had people tell me I wasn't saved. Carol and I have had people tell us the best thing we could do for Bible Baptist Church is leave. Crazy thought. I'm glad they left. But we're here and they're not. <laughs> but I think God's been here all along. Amen. And sometimes I get a little discouraged. There's not very many come, or we're struggling keeping all the bills paid, or we don't see anybody get saved for a good while. But I guess it would be worth it if we've ever had one person saved. I think the one sitting back there in the doorway got saved through this church. Amen. And we had some concern about how we'd go about it pulling that off, but God worked it out for us, didn't He, Carol? God's been good to us. Well, one little girl, she come in, she said, uh, Dad, she says, is uh, 
uh, the moon made out of green cheese. And the dad says, well, why, why would you say that? She says, well, somebody at school today told me it was. And he says, well, what's the Bible say about it? And she said, uh, I don't know. He said, well, why don't you look in your Bible and see if you can figure it out? And so she went off whistling or went off, not whistling, she just went off up to her room and she got her Bible out. In five or six minutes, she come back down. A oh, whistling. That's where I get the whistling in. Because she had found the answer. And her dad says, well, did, I thought you were going to go try to f find the answer to whether the, gr the moon's made out of green cheese. And she says, well, I did. She said, I used the scientific method. <laughs> she said, I read in the book of Genesis and I applied the scientific method. I read the first chapter of Genesis, <clears throat> and the moon was made on the fourth day, and cows weren't made until the sixth day. That's good. I like that. So she said, it can't be made out of green cheese because you don't, you got to have the cow to get the milk yeah, to make yeah. the cheese. Well, maybe, you know, if we'd spend more time reading our Bible, we might figure some things out. That's right. And then another thing, I'll give you this. Not only read it trying to figure something out, believe it when it tells you something. That's how you have assurance of your salvation. I, I'm not saved because I feel like it. Or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, my good outweighs my bad, or I got baptized, or I belong to some certain church. I'm saved because the Word of God says I am. And they took the Bible. I went to the altar when I was 11 years old. They took the Bible and opened up to John 3.16. And said, God love me. My Sunday school teacher said I could take the word world out of there and just put Jeff Stone in. For God so loved Jeff Stone that He gave His only begotten Son if He'd believe on His Son and have eternal everlasting life. And that's what I did. Now, I haven't always lived like I should. Although I got saved young, so I never did get into alcohols, drugs. And I grew up through the 60s. But we need to build on the foundation of the God's on His throne. Uh, we've got the Word of God. Then another thing, I don't believe that the church is going to be shaken. Amen. Now, some think it is. But Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's right. Shall not. Guaranteed. I believe there's always been a group of people down through history. Now, they didn't always call themselves Baptists. It's true. I don't think you can trace denomination, but I think you can trace people that believe the Bible. I believe Jesus believed the Bible. Amen. I think the disciples believed the Bible. The apostles, don't you? That's right. And the early church pretty well stuck with it, but then as time went on, some, some groups went away from it. But I believe there's always been a group that believed what Jesus believed. And I think there still is today. I believe there will always be a remnant, even up through the tribulation. That's right. And it'll get rough then. Dr. Lewis Talbot was pastor of Open Door Baptist Church in downtown Los Angeles for years. And then they started the Talbot Theological Seminary. And, but anyway, he was riding on a trolley car years ago. Somebody says, well, that must have been a long time ago. Well, yeah, he was, he's been dead for quite a while. But he was riding on this trolley car and there was, when he got on there, there's a fellow sitting there reading his Bible. And so they got to talking. And the fellow asked the, Lewis Talbot, said, uh, what church are, do you go to? And uh, he didn't really answer him. And the man, uh, so then he turned back to the man and he says, uh, 
well, what church do you go to? He says, well, I'm a Methodist. I was born Methodist, and I'm living Methodist, and I'll, I'll die Methodist. And again, the guy asked Dr. Talbot, he says, uh, what church are you, you, go, uh, you affiliated with? And his answer was, I belong to the church, which is his body. And the fellow said, I never heard of that one before. Well, you know, the body of Christ, all the saved people belong to the body of Christ. Jesus is the head, we're the fingers, the toes, whatever parts. Are you a part of the body of Christ? No. Says, no, I'm a Baptist. Uh, could you be a Baptist and be a part of the body of Christ? Yes. Could you be a Methodist and be a part of the body of Christ? Oh, yeah. Could you be non-denominational or whatever some people call themselves that? I don't care what you... Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Is He your head? Are you trying to, with your body and life, trying to follow Jesus? <coughs> anyway, then the, fellow, the man said, well, I never heard of that one. He says, that's a new one. And uh, when was it organized? <laughs> and... Dr. Talbot said, well, thousands of years ago. And uh, <clears throat> he asked, well, where's its headquarters? He said, well, it's in heaven. And the guy looked at him like he was crazy. It's in heaven. But I think the church is unshakable. There will always be people trusting Jesus. I don't care how bad the world is seems or gets or looks. What amazes me, I went down my uh, CPAP machine that hadn't been working right, and we took it down and there was a lady working down there and we got to talking to her. And she was Christian, wasn't she, Carol? We had a big long conversation. And then she had a pretty strong testimony, didn't she? And she says, you know, she doesn't say much to people because you get in trouble on your job if you try to witness to people. But she said she's had people come in there and say, well, don't we have a mutual friend? And what they're talking about is Jesus. And He our mutual friend? Amen. If we're saved, He's our head. We're His body. And... Uh, you don't have to call yourself Baptist to be a mutual friend of Jesus, That's do you? Right. Or Pentecostal. I even believe there's probably some people call themselves Catholics. That's right. That's and they're going to go to heaven. But they don't believe all the doctrines of some of these different churches. Some call themselves Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. well, it's always funny to me down in uh, Aptos on Franklin Road, one side of the street there's Church of Christ. Across the street is Church of God. <laughs> when I go down through there, you know where I'm talking about. Around 19, man. And, and uh, well, there might be some make it to heaven out of both of them, but I'm sorry to say there probably be some out of both of them won't make it. That's true. Because it doesn't depend on what denominational church you said you belong to. It depends on have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Is He the head of your? the body of Christ and you're the bride of Christ or a part of it. So then the child of God. I think that's uh, something that's unshakable. Amen. If you're saved. Do you have eternal everlasting life or do you have it just the good days? I've had some of them, you know, they get into big discussions. They think they can lose their salvation. And I've asked them, you know, well, what would happen if you died on the day you sinned? Well, I'd rather die on the day I was in church not sitting room if I believe like they did. Mm -hmm. And I've told some of them, I'd be scared to death. I'd be afraid to get off my knees. I'd have to pray all the time to make sure I was keeping it. Or I can just believe what God said in His Word. That's right. It's everlasting, eternal life. Somebody says, when do you get it? When you get saved. From then on. Ephesians 4.30 says, We're sealed into the day of redemption. Amen. You ever can anything? Mm -hmm. You put this stuff in a jar 
and you put a lid on top of it and then you let it sit there and you'll hear the lid go pop, pop. It seals. Now what's the seal do? Keeps it from going bad. Okay, Ephesians 4.30. That says you're sealed to the day of redemption. Maybe we better look at that. Well, it's good to see it in black and white, right? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. I believe that's what I'm wanting. We turn here and we look. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Yeah. You can even grieve the Holy Spirit and still be sealed. That's right. So you don't have to be perfect, apparently. Praise the Lord. Thank God. If you did, the only one to make it be Jesus. That's it. That's I'm that's thinking that. about doing a sermon on that. Don't blame God. Some say, well, Flip Wilson said the devil made me do it. <laughs> or they say, uh, God made me do it. Mm -hmm. No, you decide whether you would do it. That's right. And if you decide the wrong things, you can grieve God. Grieve the Holy Spirit. In 1 John chapter 2, and verse 17, it says the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John chapter 2, the 17th verse says, And the word world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. forever. Well, I think you're doing the will of God when you trusted Jesus. That's right. Now, I have to admit, after I trusted Jesus, sometimes I've gotten a little off track. But there's something in me called the Holy Spirit that pulls me back. Amen. It, the Holy Spirit makes me feel bad when I do wrong. Has the Holy Spirit ever dealt with you and made you feel bad when you did wrong? Well, what'd you do then? Well, you went to 1 John 1, 9, if we... Confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and that cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So you went and took a spiritual bath. Now, remember Peter, the Lord asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter kept saying, yes, I love you. Uh, but another time, you know, the Lord washed Peter's feet. And Peter told the Lord, says, no, you can't wash my feet. It's in the Gospel of John. And uh, the Lord said, well, if I don't wash your feet, then you're not mine. And Peter says, well, wash me all over. And the Lord says, you don't need to be washed all over. You were washed in the blood. Amen. Water baptism does not save people. That's right. But water baptism is being obedient to God. I had a Earl, was he a uncle, brother-in-law, and he asked me, well, why did Jesus get baptized? Because he was being obedient. After you get saved, you're supposed to get baptized. But he didn't have to get saved. But he was setting us an example. We need to get saved, but then will you get baptized after you get saved? Some don't. Wonder if you'll still make it to heaven. Well, what about all those Old Testament people? There it is. Well, I'll give you another one. I I think it's first Corinthians chapter one, I believe, verse seventeen. And I think it's possible Paul talking. There's one Might be wrong here. I know it's the 17th, I believe it's the 17th verse. Yeah, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And they're here deciding who they're going to follow. Go up to verse uh, 12. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. 
In other words, I belong to, I follow this religious leader, that religious leader, some other religious leader. Well, who started all these different denominations? One group, I don't know who started them, and that's Baptist. Most of the other denominations, you can name a person that founded it. Knox, mm -hmm. Presbyterian, Fox, Nazarene, Wesley's, Methodist. Who started the Baptist Church? Well, how did it ever come about? Now, I'll tell something I shouldn't tell. Carol and I have been married 50 how many years? Two. She says, I never ever proposed to her. Now, I don't know how we ever got married. But we got a little piece of paper that says we are. Don't we? But anyway, here are these people picking these different groups. but And Paul's one of them mentioned, verse 13. If Christ uh, is Christ divided, well, somebody says, "Well, I'm going to listen to Joel Olstein. I'm going to listen to Franklin Graham." I mean, they can name all, all kinds of people. You better be listening to Christ Amen. and what He says in the Bible. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were any of those guys crucified for you? Was the Pope? Yes, sir. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On my profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That way I can't miss. Some say Jesus only, but... I got all of it in there. I'm not going to take a chance. I Christ is Christ divided? Was Paul uh, crucified for you? Uh, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Uh, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Now, who's talking here? It's Apostle Paul. Do you think the Apostle Paul led anybody to the Lord other than these two people? Apparently, baptism not salvation then. You can get saved and not get baptized, but you can't be an obedient, faithful Christian unless you want to get baptized. That's kind of the first step after you get saved. Not to get saved. But I've gone out here and knocked on doors and a lot of these people that want to get in fusses with me and I won't argue with them. I might read them a few verses, but then I'll let it go. But the main thing, are you going to go to heaven when you die? What's going to decide that? I want to give you a verse. John chapter 6, verse 40. This is the will of Him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life. Now somebody says, well, I never did see Jesus with my eyes. But have you seen Him by faith? Do you believe Jesus was real? Yes. Well, that's seeing Him by faith. I, do you believe Jesus died on the cross for you? you believe you ought to follow Jesus? See, the will of God is not only the holiest place you can be, it's the happiest place. You know the most dangerous place a, law, a saved person can be? Out of the will of God. And the safest place you can be? Saved in the will of God. Well, when I was coming up and the Cold War was going on, everybody was, well, building bomb shelters. Anybody ever remember building bomb shelters? But if they dropped an atomic bomb, I don't know if it'd help you much. This is true. But I remember when I was in grade school at Indianapolis Public School 16, they would have 
drills, they weren't fire drills, they were bomb drills. We would all go down in the basement and get down and cover our heads up. Somebody said, that Nancy's out in the parking lot says, well, that dates you. Yeah, it does. It does. I was born, I'm a front end of the baby boomers. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, Brokaw, I think, wrote a book called The Great uh, Ge the Greatest Generation. You know, I don't believe America's wanting to rule the world or dominate the world. I believe China does. Mm -hmm. I think Russia would like to. But if America wanted to do something like that, you know when the time for them to have done that would have been? End of the Second World War. At that time, we had a pretty good sized army going. We had a nuclear weapon. But I don't believe that's because, and somebody says, why do you don't, why don't you think America, the way the American government's set up, we want everybody to have freedom. And I'm afraid we're getting to the point now, the big shakeup, they won't try to take our freedom of speech away, our freedom of religion away, even in America. And honestly, I don't think you've seen anything yet. The Antichrist is just right around the corner, I believe. Somebody says, well, preacher, where do you get all this crazy stuff? Right out of my Bible. And I don't have time to talk, discuss all of it this morning. You want to go back there to Daniel and study it? As Manny says, that had to be for another time. So let's all stand.